The determination and level of ambition among EU member countries on the need to regulate the online information environment are getting a clearer shape. In the meantime, Australia is one of the few countries that has attracted global attention with clear and practical steps toward regulating the digital space. What are the lessons learned and the way forward in this field? Good morning. You are kindly welcome to our first panel discussion, Setting Standards and Rules for a Safer Digital Environment. I should say that I was very excited when I was invited to join this panel discussion because me and my colleagues are facing those issues every day. Either we are looking for ways to fight disinformation and misinformation, extremism and divisiveness of societies, either we are trying to save media business models, or either we are fighting eroding privacy. And these are, of course, just few aspects of those uh, issues, and there are many more. And that is why I'm very happy that we have a very diverse panel today. And I do really hope that we will shed some light uh, on, on those issues and, and find some common goals and practices. And now I would like to introduce to our panelists. Ms. Sandra Kalniete, member of European Parliament, uh, Ms. Ora Sala, Head of Facebook EU Affairs Office, and Ms. Kelly Mudford, Content and Platform Projects Manager at Australian Communications and Media Authority. While there are still series of discussions going on, there are also some steps made, and uh, I think all of you heard some months ago uh, news from Australia who got worldwide attention uh, by passing the law that forces the big tech companies to pay publishers for news. And uh, we are very happy to have video message from Narida O'Loughlin, chairman of Australian Communications and Media Authority, who will tell us a bit more how did it happen and where are we now. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for that introduction. Thank you also to NATO for the invitation to participate in this morning's dialogue. Although I'm unable to join you live this morning, I'm delighted to be able to share some of Australia's recent experience. My colleague, Kelly Mudford, will be joining the panel session live to participate in the discussion. This morning, I would like to talk to you on the work underway in Australia to set standards and rules to address the impact of digital platforms and provide some of our early findings on the importance of collaboration to address these challenging issues. In international forums, I often note that Australians are early and eager adopters of technology and digital services. Our recent research found that 99% of Australian adults had used the internet in the previous six months to June 2020, up from 90% in 2019, and 72% used social networking sites or apps such as Facebook. Therefore, it's not surprising that Australia, like other countries, has been increasingly turning our attention to the impact of these platforms on domestic communications and media markets. In 2019, as many of you would know, Australia's competition regulator, the ACCC, completed a major review into the business models of digital platforms and the consequences for competition, consumers and society. The ACCC found that while traditional media businesses are struggling to remain commercially viable, Facebook and Google enjoy substantial market power, receiving nearly two thirds of all online adver uh, advertising revenue in Australia. It also showed that digital platforms play an increasingly important role in the Australian content ecosystem, particularly impacting on the supply, consumption, choice and quality of Australian news and journalistic content. These conclusions led the Australian Government to agree to a range of initiatives with a significant program of work underway to simplify the existing media and content regulatory frameworks level the playing field between online and offline content regulation and address emerging online consumer harms. The Australian Government has a strong focus on business-led solutions and ensuring that regulation does not inhibit innovation, jobs and growth. 
Consistent with that approach, the government has encouraged digital platforms to voluntarily address two critical issues identified in the ACCC's inquiry in the first instance. Firstly, all major digital platforms were asked to voluntarily develop an industry code of practice to address concerns around disinformation and news quality in Australia. Secondly, Facebook and Google were asked to develop a code to address the imbalance between news publishers and digital platforms. The ACMA was asked to oversee the disinformation codes development and report back to the government on the adequacy of platform measures. In June last year, we released a public position paper to help guide the development of the code. The paper set out our expectations as the regulator of the objectives and the scope of that code. Importantly, we suggested that the traditional intent-based definition of disinformation may no longer be sufficient to address the breadth of the issue. Conspiratorial communities made up of ordinary users are peddling harmful content. Malicious actors are getting better at hiding their tracks from content moderation tools. And evidence of inauthentic behaviour can take researchers months, months to uncover. With the current and ongoing pandemic, we have seen the potential for these falsehoods to create real world harm to both individual users and to broader societal institutions. Nearly two thirds of Australians say they have encountered misinformation about COVID-19 on social media. And a variety of surveys, including some upcoming research commissioned by the ACMA, has shown a concerning proportion of the population believe dangerous falsehoods that have been circulating online. But this is not just about the current health issues. As we have seen abroad, online misinformation and disinformation campaigns can also do significant harm by undermine, undermining trust in democratic processes. Digi, the Australian Industry Group, has led the development of the code consulting with its members, industry participants, and other interested, in, interested parties. In February, a final disinformation and misinformation code was released with six initial signatories, Facebook, Google, Twitter, Microsoft, TikTok, and Redbubble. And earlier this week, Adobe announced it has also signed up to the code. All code signatories have committed to reduce the risk of harms that may arise from the propagation of disinformation and misinformation on their platforms. They are currently preparing their initial reports about their voluntary commitments and documenting the measures they are undertaking to meet the outcomes under the code. They are also working on robust reporting guidelines and finalising a mechanism to deal with code complaints. We will report to the government on the adequacy of platforms measures under the code and the current state of disinformation in Australia next month. And while I'm not in a position today to foreshadow our findings, I will say that we have been closely watching the developments in Europe, including the evolution of their pioneering disinformation code. The Australian Government has also been working to address the bargaining imbalance between Australian news media businesses and the major digital platforms, Google and Facebook. As mentioned, the Australian Government would prefer that industry step up and address issues of user or societal concern. This means that all parties must be committed to action and have faith in that model. If voluntary codes prove ineffective or unsuccessful in driving necessarily change, the government may consider stronger regulatory measures for digital platforms. And we've already seen this play out with the development of the News Media Bargaining Code. This was initially planned to be a voluntary code, but when progress stagnated, the government decided to make the code mandatory. The News Media Bargaining Code was contentious, with digital platforms opposed from the start. Once it became clear in February this year that the code was likely to pass through the Australian Parliament, Facebook took action to temporarily ban access to news on their platform 
by Australian users, causing significant disruption to users and making many international headlines. Further negotiations between the government and the platforms led to the code finally passing on the 25th of February this year. This code provides a framework for commercial negotiations between designated digital platforms and registered news businesses. The Australian Treasurer has the power to designate platforms to participate in the code. The code also provides provisions for mediation and arbitration if parties cannot come to a commercial agreement. As the media regulator, we have been closely involved in the news business element of the code. We have the role of assessing news businesses seeking to participate in the code and appointing mediators and arbitrators in some circumstances. While some aspects of the code are yet to be enlivened, Facebook and Google have already reached agreements with many of the larger Australian publishers and other deals are currently being negotiated. And just last week, the ACCC authorised smaller publishers to collectively negotiate with Facebook and Google over payments for their news content. This shows that the commitment by the Australian Government to mandate a regulatory backstop is working as it should, incentivising parties to voluntarily come together, resulting in deals to help support the Australian news media industry. While these are two of the more prominent actions under the Digital Platforms Inquiry, there are a range of the other pieces of work underway in Australia. The Government is currently considering whether obligations relating to Australian content should be placed on subscription on demand provide providers such as Netflix. And the ACCC is also looking closely at competition issues across the digital display advertising supply chain. These too are issues facing both government and regulators in many countries. In wrapping up, I'd like to discuss the importance of collaboration. Digital platforms are run by some of the largest companies in the world and concerns about their impact and their influence are global in nature. For smaller jurisdictions like Australia, there are unique challenges dealing with international companies. Their actions are generally set from the home base in another country, and it is hard to get results tailored to the unique characteristics of our market. However, the bargaining code process has shown that actions by small countries are taken seriously and can make a difference. For many of us, digital platforms represent the regulatory coalface. In this environment, it is important that regulators continue to collaborate and work together across sectors and internationally. Opportunities like today's dialogue are important to share common experiences, successes and challenges. It's also crucial that regulators actively engage with those digital platforms. These companies have not been traditionally regulated, so there is added responsibility and challenge on us to educate and work with them on the journey. An open dialogue can help the platforms to better understand where regulators are coming from. It also helps us to better understand platforms' unique business models and what approaches they are taking to address government and society's concerns. As we continue our work towards implementing the Australian Government's Roadmap for Digital Platforms, I look forward to continuing to work together and find common ground to improve the online environment for all. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Miss O'Loughlin. I think a very inspiring example of collaboration and engagement. And now I would like to turn to Miss Sandra Kalni at the European Union currently is also working on different initiatives, including Digital Services Act and Digital Market Act. Could you tell a bit more how far EU has gotten and when we can see already something uh, finished and uh, brought in practice? Uh, 
thank you for inviting me to take part in this very important discussion. And um, uh, it is true that the example of Australia is very encouraging uh, for all of us. Um, since I have only a few minutes, I will briefly touch the key initiatives of European institutions. There are two legislative proposals currently in the European Parliament and our House aims to finish the core work by the end of this year. First, uh, the Digital Services Act. The DSA will create new legislation regarding illegal content by strengthening and raising transparency of the content moderation mechanism. The proposal maintains the current principle where companies that host others' data are not liable for the content itself, but adds obligation that once illegal content is flagged, companies are obliged to remove it. The DSA would oblige platforms to disclose how their algorithms work, on how, on how decisions to remove content are taken, and on the way advertisers target the users. It should also uh, be underscored that this legislative proposal does not cover harmful content and many of the envisaged measures co cover only large platforms. Second uh, crucial legislative proposal is Digital Markets Act, a key framework for, a governing, uh, for governing gatekeeper online platforms. This proposal has key pivotal security and privacy implications. Since we can no longer delay addressing the risks posed by the concentration of power in the hands of so few popular platforms. And third, on 21st of April, the European Commission presented the Artificial Intelligence Act. This represents the EU's first attempt to define a comprehensive regulatory framework for AI. The proposal includes bans on practices that exploit vulnerable groups or forms of government conducted social scoring. Also, real time biometric recognition systems, such as facial recognition would be banned unless they are necessary for very specific purposes. Furthermore, I would like to speak about international uh, cooperation. Uh, first of all, Europe and the United States must work closely together to offer a regulatory framework of digital space to counter the undermining of our democratic system. However, there are some potential points of tension. The EU and the US do have differences in understandings and approaches to protecting privacy rights. This includes also regulation on AI and data protection. Now about so-called digital tax. Until recently, EU tried to get the United States on board and strike an international digital tax deal. But recent President Biden's proposal to introduce universal tax of 21% for all companies with income about 20 billion is a game changer. We are facing difficult negotiations, but most important is that we are moving forward and the US administration accepts that a common system is needed. Now about data storage and data sovereignty. The EU has declared its goal to become independent from digital infrastructure provided by foreign corporations. This is a political hot potato, but reaching a compromise on these issues is essential to a true transatlantic digital partnership. And I personally uh, am convinced that a strong transatlantic partnership can serve as a backbone for our collective uh, resilience, global resilience. 
There is also a comprehensive roadmap document presented by a commission called European Democracy Action Plan. The plan foresees several relevant initiatives, legislation on transparency of sponsored political content, a joint EU collective response to malicious cyber activities, and substantial, I underline, substantial strengthening of the voluntary code of practice on disinformation, because voluntary it does not, uh, it is not enough. And to conclude my remarks, uh, today we all are aware that we cannot continue to live in the world where the internet is an unregulated wild west, where citizens do not have clarity on who, how, and why is using and manipulating their data. There is no one magic silver bullet to make EU fit for the digital age. And we work on several major initiatives and projects in parallel. Thank you for att your attention. Uh, thank you, Ms. Kalnieta, and we will definitely have follow-up questions, but now I think it's uh, a time to have somebody from this unregulated Wild West also, <laughs> also join to this discussion. And uh, Ms. Orasal, I would like to ask you to give overview, because like, like on everyday news we see that uh, Facebook is criticized about something that it's not doing or doing something and so on and so on. Uh, where are you now? Because I understand quite clearly you are in some kind of coordination with governments, with institutions, but still there is a lot of pressure on you to do also some self-regulatory measures. So how do you see this process? Thank you so much and thank you for having me here today. Every day internet platforms like Facebook make decisions on where to draw the line between freedom of expression and hate speech, or between private, uh, privacy and safety. We fully understand uh, and agree that self-regulatory initiatives are not enough. And we believe that private companies like us should not be making so many important decisions about who has the ability to speak and what content can be shared on our platforms. That is why we have been calling for regulation from democratically elected decision makers for years now. However, this requires also a deep understanding of, of the policymakers, how these technologies actually work and what are the impacts of the proposed laws in people's everyday lives. And that's why these kind of dialogues are so crucial. Regulation of harmful and illegal content is particularly important to ensure companies are making decisions about online speeds in a way that minimizes harm, but also respects the fundamental right of free, free expression. That's why we welcome the European Commission's proposal on the Digital Services Act, as well as the European Democratic, uh, Democratic Action Plan, the upcoming EU proposal to secure our democracy and elections. And uh, we look very much forward to engaging with co-legislators going forward. As we all know, social media is part of our everyday lives and uh, it is changing our social connections and also reshaping the way political discussions are taking place. We are fully aware of our responsibilities, and we take them almost seriously. And we don't minimize in any way uh, challenging issues like fake news, misinformation, or disinformation. They are real, they are serious, and we are working very hard at Facebook to tackle them. Because let me assure you, Facebook does not benefit in any way on hate speech, the opposite. Our users, Companies on our platforms, they don't want to see it, and we don't want to see it. For example, we removed more than uh, 12 million pieces of content of COVID-19 related misinformation on Facebook and Instagram already first half of last year, containing misinformation that could lead to imminent physical harm. Uh, yes, you might say that that's never enough, but we are doing our utmost best there because it's very important for our company. But also... Um, a technology that has the uh, capacity to expand and, and diversify political equality around the world, 
is good in many ways. We cannot deny that. Most other forms of political engagement tend to favor those with most wealth uh, or access, but not social media. Around the world, social media is making it easier for people to have a voice in government, to discuss issues, organize, uh, organize around different causes, and also importantly, ho hold our leaders accountable. Facebook has been designed to connect, fr connect friends and family. And it is excellent in that. But as uh, unprecedented numbers of people channel their political energy through this, uh, this medium, it's been used in unintended ways with social, societal uh, consequences. We are working uh, diligently to neutralize these risks and we are getting results as the commission has also recognized publicly in the EU. But we cannot do this alone. Uh, which is why we continuously engage with lawmakers, civil society, and our peers, but also those of, of you who use online platforms every day. Um, I'm very much looking forward to this conversation and, and your, your questions. Thank you so much. Ora, and yes, I should remind all our viewers uh, that you, you can uh, ask questions to our panelists and really engage in discussion. But while we are still uh, waiting for some questions, I saw Ms. Kalni uh, was, was, was smiling a bit and, uh, and making some, uh, some, some other facial expressions. So I, I, sh I would like to go back to you. And maybe coming back from what Ora said that uh, actually, uh, sometimes politicians and institutions do not understand completely how do social platforms work and that you should uh, do more to understand and also maybe for example as we know European institutions are very slow on doing anything sorry for this critique but but for example you are now working on those series of facts but when they come to light actually some other uh, issues or important on social platforms because digital digital platforms and te technologies are uh, are very rapidly changing. Is it a question to me? Or? Yes. Yes. Oh, sorry, I, I did not realize that I thought that this is your comment. And the next time I will have absolutely frozen facial expression because I was not aware that I am observed. Why I was smiling? First of all, I would like to say that we really have to work together, platforms and legislators. But uh, the, the observation that legislative process is slower than development of technologies it's even not pertinent because it's so obvious. Even when before the era of digital uh, space and the speed, legisl legislative process always was behind the reality and the needs of reality. Then just imagine how uh, speedy we should work. Today, it is not possible. We are trying to be thorough and um, to get uh, uh, legislation which suits to the needs of democracy, but in the same time also protects democracy. Because I agree fully with Aura that um, um, uh, the possibilities opened by digital um, uh, connection they are immense and the positive part is immense. But now we have to concentrate on negative part. And I was smiling about um, disinformation and link to monetization of disinformation, which is quite a usual practice in platforms. Okay, thank you. And we have a question from audience to Ora. Is the different is there a difference between free speech, hate speech, and unwanted opinion distinguished fast enough? Isn't there a big danger of overreacting and therapy suppressing legal free speech? Is the artificial intelligence, the human behind the filter, good enough to make this decision correctly? Thank you. First, I would like to react uh, saying that uh, we don't be benefit from hate speech in any way. 
So our business model is that the companies are advertising on our platforms and our customers or their customers on our platforms, they don't want to see hate speech. So this is something I really want to correct. And then this question, that's why uh, because lawmakers have been so, so slow, we are doing uh, a lot of self-regulatory uh, uh, we are we are taking a self-regulatory approach because we need to take that, and uh, we have our community standards on our platforms. So when you sign up for any of our platforms, you also sign up to these community standards, which doesn't, for example, allow hate speech and gives you how to be behave on our platforms. But that's not enough. So that's why we have the uh, independent oversight board which also made the decision on Trump, uh, Trump case, for example, because we don't think that we are in the right position of doing these, these decisions by ourselves. And because there is no regulation on this, we wanted to have this independent oversight board to look into these decisions so that we don't step on those of free, free speech and we are fully committed then uh, act uh, how the oversight board actually decides, like on this Trump case. No, uh, AI technology is, is not enough. Uh, it's very good. And uh, we take down over 96% of hate speech online at the moment. It's almost 99% when it's illegal content. So that's why, as you also said, it's important that we define what is illegal, what is hate speech. And we would like to see this in the European, uh, uh, in the DSA, hopefully also coming from the European Parliament, uh, when, when it didn't come from the European Commission. Uh, but that's not enough what we do with AI, because it cannot recognize everything, uh, what, how human behaves. So that's why we also have uh, 35,000 people working on safety and security on our platforms. And some might say that it's not enough. It's never enough. Uh, there, I don't think that there is never enough police forces and there will always be some crimes, but we are doing our utmost best uh, to, to find, find uh, uh, as good solutions as possible. I understand correctly from what you said, like, because there is this overall impression that actually all the big tech companies are happy that there are no regulation, but now you are saying that you actually would like and welcome uh, some regulation, legislation. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, because I don't, we don't think that it's enough that we self-regulate ourselves. Because yes, we are a private company, but we have a huge responsibility also in societies. What we see, for example, in different elections globally. So we cannot uh, pretend that we are only a private company and we don't have a responsibility in this kind of a public sphere where these conversations are on our platforms, right? But there we need also democratically elected decision makers to help us out and make the rightful uh, regulation. Uh, and when this is not in place, we need to do self-regulatory actions, of course. So yes, we welcome regulation. <laughs> But this is uh, totally something new, and I hope that uh, uh, both uh, representatives from Australia and the EU has recorded this because, uh, because <laughs> really something new to know, because like, um, yes, previously it has been always, you know, like trying to avoid. Okay, but now I would like to involve also Carly to our uh, discussion. Uh, uh, like because you are really a bit step forward if we compare, for example, with the European Union. And what are your main lessons learned about the legislative norms, regulation already in place? And how do you approach the issues of freedom of speech online in Australia? This is also a question from our audience. Thank you very much for the question. Um, so I might sort of reflect um, back on some of that discussion because I, I think it's very sort of easy to say, you know, there is a need to have like regulation in this space, particularly around freedom of issue, uh, expression issues. Uh, but once you actually get into that more broader conversation about what the regulatory settings may look like or um, what the, the what the framework might look like is actually uh, quite a different sort of discussion. So I think there's a few things I would reflect back on in terms of uh, where we are at with, with our process and the lessons learned. I think it's particularly important, I think, as um, Ms. O'Loughlin said, is to actually have that discussion uh, with uh, the platforms as well as other interested parties 
across um, the, the ecosystem of stakeholders. Uh, the second uh, point I would probably reflect on is political will is very, very important and political support in relation to uh, developing uh, regulations and legislation. Um, and the third, I think, is the fact that it is very challenging, particularly in relation to these issues around that impact freedom of speech, misinformation. It is quite a delicate and nuanced balance, regulatory balance um, to get the regulatory settings right. So I think when we talk about regulation, I think we need to talk about um, outcomes-based regulatory approaches in this area where you can actually look at um, more fundamental high-level outcomes about what you actually want to do to protect users' freedom of expression, uh, protect them from harms, but also empower them uh, to make good decisions themselves, whether that be around digital literacy or also actually a role of them actually understanding what the platforms have in place already, the systems that um, and rules that support that so they are, there is some sort of level of transparency when um, escalated actions, different measures are applied to content and uh, the profiles and pages, there actually is a confidence around the ecosystem as a whole rather than we see sort of headlines around uh, content or, uh, you know, particular profiles being banned. I would like to clarify a bit uh, from what uh, Orisalo also told that they are really happy to cooperate. But what we could hear from uh, from uh, uh, Ms. Lochlin that uh, at least at the beginning there wasn't like this very happy voluntarily, you know, like cooperation. How? how this cooperation with platforms is going now in Australia when, when you force them a bit to cooperate? I think it's going well. I, I think when you start, um, you know, regulators and their regulated entities um, often start from different points of view. That, that's, you know, how the, the regulatory system works. It's often not surprising that regulated entities and regulators aren't necessarily on the same page. And I think that is important to have that and continue that discussion so each can actually understand where they're at, what the positions are. Um, and for us, you know, government has made a decision um, and then we have a job to protect the public interest and, and work to try and make those regulations work um, the best they can. Um, as Ms O'Loughlin said, with the, the media bargaining code, at this stage, it is working as it was anticipated. It was to create a uh, commercial a bargaining arrangement, a framework for two, platform, two parties to come to the table. Um, and that's what we're seeing here in Australia at the moment. So, um, yes. <laughs> uh, thank you a lot. And uh, now I would like to uh, go back to Ms. Kalniete. You are also rapporteur at ING, the Special Committee for Foreign Interference uh, in all democratic processes in the EU, including disinformation at the European Parliament. And we have uh, the question from audience actually connected to this work you are doing. Uh, researchers of influence operations have noted a tendency for hostile actors to diversify their presence on a variety of platforms Platforms. Current EU legislation does not prohibit disinformation. It only requires assessments of systemic risks and then only for very large platforms. Have the EU Parliament's committees looked at this issue? Uh, this is a very pertinent question because it really touches to very painful point. Because even DSA, Digital Service Act, it deals with um, illegal content. And then between illegal content and the impact, there is a gray zone where there's a lot of uh, harmful intent, harmful content, which is very difficult to uh, box. To, to define, but the impact of these actions, different sort of uh, straw donors, information laundering, etc., is immense. We have seen it in Washington on 6th of January. What can be done if you are polluting internet uh, with uh, 
during four years with harmful intent. Uh, yes, we are looking to it, and that's why we need this European Democracy Act. And Commissioner Jourova, uh, she promised that during uh, this uh, and next year, there will come out the legislative proposals which would focus on these as I call it, gray areas linked to political advertisement and other um, uh, phenomena. Yeah. But I, if I may, I just want to get back again to something what we discussed before regarding the support of platforms to this dialogue and to legislative clarity um, in in this digital area. You know, in our committee, we have had quite many um, meetings in camera with whistleblowers coming from platforms. And what they told us, it is not exactly what you are telling about your um, uh, wish to, uh, to have a regulated uh, digital space for platforms. Thank you. Or would you like to comment this, uh, Ms. Collins? Yes, I would very much like to comment because actually I have the voice of the company here. So when I'm telling this publicly, be, feel free to tweet. So we are fully committed uh, to, to having more regulation. And uh, that's why we are here to engage also today. So I would not care about whistleblowers. I think it's better if this comes publicly from the company. And actually, as I understand, there is also a lot of lobbying uh, from your and other platform and other platforms in uh, EU institutions. But uh, to continue with you, uh, Aura, and this uh, topic, we have a question from the audience. Having heard about your interest in clear regulation of the digital environment, what would you say? How are the relations between different players on the market influencing the potential result of the regulation development? And of course, we know all those issues, for example, a constant Facebook fight with Apple, and we saw this uh, Signal uh, news story this week where, again, Facebook against Signal. How is it possible, actually, to even get consent uh, among those big tech companies, not talking about some institutions and governments? Well, I cannot speak on behalf of any other company than, than myself. Uh, and for us, any clarity coming from the EU as an EU, EU leader here, uh, it, would be, it would be helpful. And also, um, as, we, as we have been speaking here a lot about the Digital Services Act, but I would also like to touch bases on the Digital Market Act, uh, where we see a really fundamental change in a mindset of the European Union regulating individual companies. Uh, and not only the market and uh, thinking about the well-functioning single market, which is crucial for the economic growth in the EU. As a European citizen, I fully agree with the European lawmakers that we need to see these European digital champions flourishing from the EU. And we welcome also competition uh, as, a, as a company. However, as we know, we cannot have law just against Facebook, Amazon or Google. Law is the same for everyone. And this is something that we we need to think also in the EU when we have want to have a big digital champions, but then the price that they will pay becoming a really big is that the EU wants to split them. So I would just also like to welcome this conversation around Digital Markets Act and what we actually want from this single market. We want it to be secured. We want it to be safe. We want to have a freedom of expression. Finding a balance here, it is crucial and it is difficult, but also finding a way to have a real European uh, single market where companies like Nokia from my country of origin could grow and compete uh, together with us US companies. So there are many things where we need to find a balance in this regulatory, regulatory world. So, uh, I, I would like to clarify, do you mean that uh, it's better that EU or some government regulates? It's not possible that, for example, you all those big tech companies come around the table and also decide on some self-regulation so it gets much easier? 
No, as I said, if you speak about self-regulation, uh, we do that a lot. That's, that's what we need to do because there is no regulation in place. Uh, and that's why we want to keep our platform safe. Uh, and also, I can assure you that we are not the same company that we were, let's say, 2017 or even a year ago. We have changed uh, tremendously in one year uh, already, and we keep changing. And this is one thing that I really appreciate working in this company is that we, we want to change and we understand these huge responsibilities that we have for safety and security. So that's why I don't really appreciate these conversations that someone who has been working in the company even half a year ago goes out and says that company does this and this because one month ago we didn't do many things. And uh, for example, COVID-19, we are basically taking down and collaborating with different authorities in different member states, like every day and tackling these challenges together. So we are also able to change and that's what we are doing here. And we are self-regulating ourselves. Uh, on self-regulating, of course, uh, uh, I would like to uh, hear from you a bit more about uh, Facebook Oversight Board because, uh, like the, again, uh, this week they made this uh, decision which was very controversial on Mr. Trump and actually the ball is back at your yard and you have to decide now what to do and of course this, uh, this is a much bigger question, not only about Mr. Trump but there are many other politicians with, with, uh, with hate speech and other other, uh, other ways of disinformation uh, using platforms and how do you see it if you also mentioned that uh, self-regulation is very important how actually this can go forward yeah so we said at the time that we believe our decision was necessary what comes to Trump and it was right so we are really pleased that the board has recognized that uh, and uh, as we said we are fully committing ourselves to these decisions by the oversight board and that's what we are going to do uh, and also i would like to uh, mention that it's not only trump we have been uh, we are not censoring so and we are not a media company so uh, we don't edit any content on our platforms we take down when it goes uh, goes against our community standards for example violence racism those are the things that doesn't belong to our platform. So, uh, uh, for example, in Brazil, uh, Bolsonaro's comments on uh, denying some, some um, aspects of COVID-19 and spreading misinformation, we take down. We saw something also in Georgia where we took down statements from two congressmen. So it's not only in the US, uh, we are looking, this is a global issue, but uh, yes, I think that this is necessary to have this kind of independent oversight board where we commit then to their decisions. Maybe one day we will see this kind of oversight board coming from the EU or Australia, uh, but at the moment there is no such a thing in place, so that's why we wanted to have this. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, Ms. Kalnet also raised a hand, and actually I already would like also to ask a question to both of you, Ms. Kalnet and also Kelly Mumford. Uh, is such kind of self-regulation or such kind of boards also the possibility how do we regulate uh, this market? Ms. Kalnet, you, you raised hand, maybe you could start. Yeah, before I answer to your question, um, I would like to ask a question to Aura about small languages, because I'm elected from Latvia and um, uh, recently uh, I also had a lot of uh, exchange with other members of parliament who are elected from uh, countries with uh, small languages, for instance, Australia, um, uh, that is an English language world. But even for France, it is difficult to remove the content after fact checkers make a signal uh, that this fact is not is disinformation, that it's not a fact. And um, uh, you, I know that you work with algorithms, but you have to um, to be a more substantially developed developed algorithms because our um, prime minister's name in translation is war and uh, there are few occasions when his uh, um, uh, a communication with his name has been removed from uh, from facebook 
because of war. That is what I would ask you to answer later. But uh, regarding the, the question you, yeah, can you shortly remind me the question? Yes, yeah. uh, the, question uh, the question was actually, Aura mentioned this uh, uh, example of Facebook oversight board, uh, actually the okay. way how, I, I how we can self-regulate. Do you see it is mm -hmm. also could be this uh, part of uh, future regulation of those platforms? Self-regulation, self-regulation is very important, but there have to be general rules, which is uh, on the level of uh, legislator, adopted by legislator, because self-regulation never will be complete. Also, legislation never will be complete, but there have to be um, uh, a sort of uh, uh, exchange and uh, cooperation in this uh, field. I strongly believe that self-regulation could be adopted in a speedier way than a legislation on national or European way level because it takes more of effort, several readings, etc., etc. Thank you. Ms. Matford, your comment? Um, I would comment when in Australia, we talk about self-regulation, not in terms of an individual party like Facebook being able to regulate itself, but the industry as a whole being able to collectively come together and agree to sets of rules, structures, oversight sort of structures, how they deal with complaints. Um, so when I think where we are in terms of our discussions and our evaluation um, on our dis disinformation and misinformation code, I think, you know, there is still some way to go in terms of whether the industry, our assessment about whether the industry has that capacity themselves before there is a need for any sort of additional regulatory uh, intervention or legislative um, backing, I should say. But I think it's clear to actually sort of whether the industry itself can regulate and there is some sort of commitment before we start discussing models around, you know, oversight boards, because in an ideal world, it would be, it would be good and for the, the industry as a whole to have that ability. Some kind of code of ethics. I know maybe we could go back to Aura Sala and answering the question posed by Sandra Kalniete. Thank you so much. I couldn't agree with you more. I come from myself fin from Finland. I'm actually in Helsinki at the moment, and I can assure you that my language doesn't relate to any other language, languages, uh, maybe to Estonian a little bit. And uh, I can also assure you that I keep fighting as an EU leader that all 27 member states are as important uh, as the big member states. So we are actually uh, committed uh, adding resources uh, and fact checkers. We just made a deal before the municipal elections in Finland 13 of June with new fact checkers organization. And uh, this is something, of course, in, in America, you might know if you have ever been associating with it, uh, Americans that they don't always think that all uh, smallest uh, member states in, in the EU or in the world, the languages are as important as English, but I think that they recognize it now more and more, because also in the EU, this is a make, making all 27 matters. So uh, I'm there with you and I understand your, your problems. I have been running in, in three elections in Finland myself and uh, algorithms just cannot recognize these small languages. Uh, so that's why we are doing our best to get more resources there. And uh, maybe my, my boss doesn't really uh, applaud me if I already tell that we, but we, we are trying to find a person also responsible for your country at the moment. So, um, and I think we have great candidates. So, so definitely I hear you and uh, we need to have more resources there. So it's good news. Our prime minister's name will not be banned anymore from Facebook. 
but to continue with with really with uh, our if we could continue with you uh, you mentioned a lot of initiatives on on how uh, we can fact check how we can uh, report fake news and then now for example also my colleagues from Baltics uh, are also contributing journalists and uh, NGOs and so on but still for example people are feeling that it's not enough and we have uh, the question from the audience maybe you could comment why Facebook do not offer the possibility to report the fake news for example a photo which is not harmful as content may have uh, fake news or harmful text as descrip description and the answer from Facebook is that it's not it is not acting against the rules. Practically, it's impossible to report in reality many types of content. So I presume the question is not like uh, Ms. Kalnieta had a question about small languages. It's also about how do we make those technologies better that we can report also some parts of, of fake news, maybe if it's not all the content. Absolutely, absolutely. No, I, I understand this problem. We just need to remember also that we have 3 billion users on our platforms and we have hundreds of millions of posts per day. So even we are doing our utmost best, our uh, like technology and algorithms are not that developed that they could really also assess all possible content. That's why we are adding resources there. We are adding more eyes to review these things. Uh, and for example, Holocaust denials, they don't have place on our platforms. That's uh, in our community standards, as you know al already, maybe many of you. However, then there can be groups of historians uh, talking about these things. So then also algorithms takes these things down, right? So it's not so uh, easy <laughs> to train these algorithms because uh, they don't understand also always nuances and cultural differences. But we are doing our best, our best there. And yes, you can report, as you know, on all of our platforms. And uh, there should be humanized as much as possible. And uh, but I assure you, it's not easy. We are doing our best. So, uh, uh, and is there any time in the near future when we can say, "Oh, now it's going to be perfect," or <laughs> it's not possible? <laughs> I don't think that the world will ever be ever perfect. I don't think that any of us thinks that because there will always be crime. There will always be, unfortunately, disinformation and misinformation, not only on our platforms, as we know, on the offline world. So, uh, yeah, I think we all would like to see that day that the world is perfect. Okay, and now we will go back to Ms. Mutford uh, and the question from the audience. I see that it is still unclear whether those platforms are news source or social area. This situation makes room for illegal activities and increased maneuvering cap capability of false flaggers. How do you approach those multi-user platforms while you are working on regulations? Are those platforms new source, social area, or hybrid? I presume it's more like about formulating with whom you are dealing, actually. Apologies, I think I've got a bit of a, a lag on my end. Sorry? Um, I would say... Oh. I would say it depends on the platform that you're actually uh, dealing with in terms of the issue around, you know, publisher transmission and then working out uh, appropriate regulatory settings to um, facilitate a regulatory outcome. Um, as I said, I think I may have said earlier, um, we've taken, particularly in the missing disinformation space, um, looking at outcomes-based approaches where we actually have suggested to the platforms that, you know, they look at user-based outcomes and then um, they implement measures themselves to actually address the specific harms on their, on their platforms. And some of those can be around um, both uh, promotion of creditable news, news and credibility signalling, um, as well as working and partnering um, with, uh, you know, reputable uh, news outlets to, um, you know, publicise and promote news on their platforms. Because I think news on, um, particularly from a 
wide diversity of sources actually is one of the key things um, that assists in managing mis and disinformation. Thank you. And I would like to go back to Ms. Kalnieta. You, at the very beginning, mentioned also initiatives around digital tax. And this is something where uh, use differs. As you mentioned, uh, USA has came up with this 21% for, for, uh, for most richest companies. EU fully do not agree with it, especially some of the EU countries which have a very low tax. And also OECD is working on the initiative which is going to be published in the mid of summer. So if we talk about uh, transatlantic relationship and, uh, and such kind of issues, uh, how do we see this relationship and how can we maybe do better, especially when it comes to regulation of big tech? Uh, very good question. Very difficult question because each of countries has its own interests and its own industries to protect, to profit and uh, uh, to play in the global world. But um, uh, United States, after uh, recent political events uh, during past four years, um, uh, are growing more and more conscious that we need a global system, how to regulate uh, digital uh, environment. Uh, and um, European principle, what we are proposing, and I haven't heard any objections on that from the United States, is uh, the basic one, is that what is uh, illegal offline must be illegal online. The difficulty is how to get there. And it, of course, is also very much related to financial issues. Uh, before I get to taxes, um, I... Um, uh, I want to raise question for all or later to, to answer. Um, what about transparency on political uh, on financing of political advertisements in on, on your platform? Because it is a very important issue. Because there are so many ways how by money laundering, by proxy um, uh, NGOs, etc., you can uh, make political advertisements. Now about the. Uh, taxation. Uh, we want, uh, one of the dangers is that there are some countries in the European Union which already adopted legislation on digital tax across the borders. And the nightmare would be to have 20, and that will be a nightmare for Facebook and for all platforms, to have 27 different taxation regimes. That's why we want to, to to have united EU taxation regime. And in the framework of OECD, uh, we also raised this issue um, uh, for several rounds of negotiations and quite unsuccessfully because uh, when, remember, I mentioned that we want to be, Europe wants to be independent from uh, in international corporations, uh, on, on, on servers and other equipment. Uh, and that is very much linked to that. Uh, the, the lack of agreement uh, was, um, I would say, was a completely changed after recent Biden's announcement on uh, uh, cover, covering universal tax because it's cover, it covers digital companies, about 20 billion income, and it comes uh, covers also companies like Volkswagen, like Total, and for European Union, since this is on the table for a very short time, it's too early to say what will be our reaction, because there are too many national Mm, uh, different um, attitudes and it needs time to be analyzed. But we also are very conscious that we need to come to an agreement. Okay. Uh, would you like to answer uh, Ms. Kalnit's question? Yeah, absolutely. And I can also reflect this digital tax with you, if you wish, mm -hmm. maybe. Yeah. It's interesting yeah. also from our perspective. 
So uh, first and foremost, I think it's uh, important to say here that we we pay taxes uh, like according to the law. Uh, and uh, it's not a question that if we pay or not pay tax, it's where we pay tax. And we fully understand that we also make profits in the EU. So so we need to we, we need to pay tax. Uh, but we would very much welcome this uh, OECD level uh, decision here, because I think this is a global global issue and we are uh, doing our business globally. But we also understand that if this doesn't happen at the OECD level, the EU is moving forward. Uh, and as you said, for us having then 27 different rules, and it's not only for us, it is, let's say, smaller European companies who try to do business in the European single market, and then you have 27 different tax rules. It's it's a, you, you cannot really compete then uh, EU and, and US. So also for EU's competitiveness, it's important to have at least EU level EU level rules here. But coming from a small member state, this kind of a turnover tax that would benefit maybe Germany and France. This is something that I would like to alert EU about. Uh, however, yes, we, we would like to see the OECD solution or EU solution there. Uh, and then about the political advertisement. Uh, yes, uh, it's in the code of practices also, uh, and we have been really since the last European Parliament elections, as you know, uh, we have been um, uh, doing our utmost best to make the process as transparent as possible. So when you advertise uh, in elections, uh, in elections or any time uh, as a politician, you need to submit your uh, passport or ID card and your credit card information. And every time you advertise from your page, uh, you need it, it, it appears who pays this advertisement. And also it goes to this political ads library where you can where everyone can check uh, all political advertisements. Of course, then there was this problem that the, what the European Commission wanted to have is uh, no cross-border political advertisement, which meant that then European level political parties could not advertise. And also then this became a social, uh, like if you have a social issue, you cannot advertise. And then some NGO said that it is impossible for Red Cross, for example, because they cannot advertise. So there are still some hiccups, uh, but that comes uh, from the commission, not uh, from, from, from our side. But uh, for us, it is very uh, important that this is transparent. And uh, we hope that there will be uh, clearer guidance also now in the European Democracy Action Plan. And what we know now is that uh, it is difficult because actually uh, elections are in the national competence of member states, as we know. So I know that the European Commission is trying to propose something at the EU level, uh, but it is also we need to then ask from all 27, are they, are they ready that we will have EU level rules here again? We would welcome them. Uh, but uh, this is, of course, conversations that the member states need to have. But I'm there with you. Transparency is very important and also how they finance these campaigns. Ms. Kalniet, do you think it's a EU level issue or it's still an uh, issue Facebook should resolve? Uh, accountability, um, I think uh, there, there could be more accountability because it's not only Facebook, we are speaking also here about other platforms. The aura is here present and that's why the bulk of the heavy questions is on her shoulders. But there could, we need more transparency in this and also clear accountability rules. Thank you. And uh, now the question goes to all of you. Like, of course, we are now discussing about uh, issues which are relevant today. It's disinformation, it's, uh, it's algorithms and so on. But we see that technologies are changing very rapidly. And do those regulations, either they are EU institutions, governments, or self-regulation acts by platforms, do they address actually those to m possible tomorrow's threats we will be facing? Maybe it's, you know, like we pass something which is actually not correlating with already today's world. Whoever you, you wants want to start. To 
<laughs> I don't want to, but uh, I feel that since I'm first in the row, I have to start. Um, uh, first of all, we have to be very conscious that we all are in terra incognita. And uh, not only in the sense of uh, legislation, but also in the progress of technological development. Uh, what was uh, novelty for the the elections of uh, 2016 in the United States? Uh, it's already old story in today, and that's why um, uh, I would uh, I, I'm not so knowledgeable even to foresee what sort of legislative acts we would need in two years because we still have no acts what we needed four years ago. We still have no legislative acts because that Wild West space is uh, still more or less voluntary regulation. Thank you. So, so you have to work faster. Legislative process is not fast and never will be. Who wants to comment? Maybe I could take it, yeah. uh, take it then next. Uh, I have to say that uh, I think we have a huge responsibility. Actually, I know that we have as a company a huge responsibility because we are developing artificial intelligence. We are de developing our services. I'm not only speaking on behalf of Facebook, I'm speaking on behalf of different uh, technology companies. And I think that we have learned our lesson that we need to also understand what kind of a, what kind of a role we have in different societies and uh, in different political debates, elections, uh, societal questions and that's why uh, our company also wants to make a, uh, take a stand what comes to human rights equality sustainability and uh, these are not just words because we also understand that we will not have users we will not have uh, companies who wants to advertise on our our platforms if we don't take these things seriously if you put hashtag sustainability or climate change to Instagram these days. You can see that it's a global thing. Our teenagers are there to actually making a change. So we need to take a responsibility as a, as a company also what happens on our platforms. So yes, as I'm saying, we need regulation. Yes, we need cooperation with democratically elected decision makers, NGOs, civil society, everyone in society. But we also understand what is our responsibility much better than we did two years ago, even, even one month ago, as I said, because this is so uh, speedy process. Okay, so you are now uh, Miss Mudford. Thank you. I would just sort of add, um, agreeing with Sandra, that legislation is always slower than the development of the technology. Yet at the same time, as we've seen, the impact on both societal institutions and individual citizens and users is, is largely the same. I think what changes is what we actually learn about that impact and the effectiveness of the measures that the platforms are putting in now and also the impact of government regulation. So I think there's, there's two kind of key takeouts for me. The first is actually focusing on that impact and harm. And the second is actually working together to build uh, metrics and KPIs and the collection of data so we actually better understand um, the problem and use that data to actually work together to, to build better solutions, whether they be regulatory or not. Um, because I think you know, a lot of these problems are, you know, disinformation and misinformation have been around for long periods of time, just in different um, forms. It's just the, the technology and, that is the, the difference here. Uh, have you identified those problems, problems of tomorrow you will be facing? Um, I think it's deep fake. Deep fake is one of them. Uh, that will be very difficult. Ms. Mudford, you wanted also to... 
I, I also think that one of the emerging technologies is the increasing use of audio with platforms. Um, we've, we've done a lot around visuals, but I think audio presents quite new challenges for us all. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Orestola, do you want to also comment something or about tomorrow's problems? If not, then we have a question from the audience, from you. <laughs> Uh, uh, to Facebook, uh, the question to Facebook, where you stand on the issue of algorithm transparency to regulatory bodies, and what do you think about the new Apple software that changes the approach in privacy and location services? Yeah, so we are fully supportive of accountability and transparency when it comes to algorithms. Uh, and that's why we do quarterly reports, uh, uh, CSER, uh, and so on. Uh, so, and we really must look look forward to engaging the DSA in further saving the principles and rules for accountability of of very large platforms uh, like like ourselves. And also, uh, we are not even waiting the legislation. We already made some really fundamental changes on our platform. So if you now go to your Facebook feed, uh, you can change it to be most recent. So it means that it comes in a chronological order. So, um, so that because we have been we have been blamed that we create these echo chambers and uh, uh, bubbles on our platforms. So, so even we might lose some some revenue there. I think it's just important that we take this responsibility and give our users an option that they can choose what kind of a news feed they want to have. And we also change the algorithms the or, way that. Uh, I'm really sorry for interrupting you, but do you communicate it enough for your users? Because I could bet that most of the users don't know that they have this possibility to get rid of echo chambers. Do yeah, you I communicate think it enough? Point. I think I need to turn to media here. I can assure you that we are communicating as a company. Uh, you can have this in all our newsroom posts on my Twitter uh, account. So, uh, you know, this was not an advertisement, but you can follow us on Twitter also. So our competitors platform. So definitely we communicate this because it's good for us, but then it's a different thing what media raises. And it's also important sometimes to knowledge that media raises things that are uh, somehow more maybe maybe even hateful or it, it's not like a positive news doesn't really reach reach the top of, of news outlets but definitely we communicate this because this is such a positive thing for us to us to tell so uh yeah you can choose this most recent on our on our platforms and also we change the algorithms the way that uh, it prefers uh, your friends post uh, posts and then your family's family's uh, postings uh, because we know that these are what people actually want to see on our platforms you can also uh, put favorites there. So you add like uh, your 10 closest friends and you want to see their posts. I have tailor made my news feed completely. So I really like it now uh, on, on my Instagram and Facebook because you can really tailor make it. And this is our like, uh, we, we want to have transparency. We are committed for transparency and accountability here. And also we want to change our platforms uh, the way users wants to, say, uh, wants, to, wants to see those because that's how we benefit from this, uh, this um, in this business. And uh, the other question was about Apple software that changes the approach in privacy and location services. Could you follow up on this? I'm not going to touch bases on Apple. I'm not going to talk about any of my competitors because it doesn't make uh, any, any sense for me. And uh, also uh, on our platforms, you can choose uh, how you want to uh, like set your privacy, privacy settings on all our platforms. Okay. Um, Skalni, you raised hand. You wanted to comment something. No, I again, I wanted to uh, continue about transparency uh, because Aura uh, affirmed that uh, transparency of algorithms. And my question is, uh, would uh, that include also uh, 
uh, the transparency for those who want to make a research on your algorithms, because this is a very important area to understand uh, how your algorithms function. For instance, you said that uh, you um, took down 90% of hate speech. Uh, that would be interesting to compare how, uh, how many new um, hate speech uh, uh, communications came into that and how many false identities were created who distribute that uh, and that's why the accessibility for researchers is something which we demand thank you Absolutely, and I agree with you, and that's why we do it. We do, we do it with many universities in the EU, as you may also already know, so we do data sharing with researchers. We actually, uh, we report uh, quarterly uh, our transparency reports on hate speech, on different, uh, different types of hate speech on our platforms, and it's publicly available for everyone to go and see how we actually uh, get this data out from our platforms. That is very important, important for us. Uh, one thing that I want to clarify on data sharing. We cannot share our platform's data with everyone. And I think that everyone will understand this because there are also bad actors out there who wants to use it, right? So that's why we are committed of sharing data with um, uh, objective uh, researchers from different universities, for example, in the EU. And I think that makes sense for, for everyone and for the research community, community also. So this, um, uh, this code of practice on tackling misinformation also, this, uh, the, where we committed in the, uh, with the European Commission, we also report to them. And then the commission publishes these reports uh, after their assessment. So it's not only us who are giving our uh, our assessments on our hate speech uh, transparency reports. It's also the European Commission making this. So of course we need to have these third uh, third parties who do these assessments as well as we do. So yes, we share data. Uh, I think we do it even more than than people always realize. But we need to be very careful, of course, that um, with whom we do this. Okay, thank you. And maybe you have questions for each other because we are coming to an end of our discussion, which has been very, very interesting. Maybe you still have some unanswered questions to each other. If not, then I would like to ask each of you uh, tell a bit your vision. How do you see the digital environment in five or seven years term? How do you see... <laughs> it's not so awful, Ms. Kalniet. So how do, you, how do you see it? Where will be, will be? Will we will be really in this very, very perfect world or there will be still wild west, at least some of impressions from you? Who would like to start? Well, I, I can start, so I'm <laughs> saving Aliette being first. And maybe I use three words, uh, responsible, transparent and accountable. Those are the three principles I would like to see in, in, uh, in different laws, uh, not only in the EU, of course, as an EU leader, I would like to see those in the EU, but also as a global company, I need to speak on behalf of, of different, uh, different areas uh, in the world. And uh, one thing I would like to commit uh, in, my, in my own role and also as a company is uh, engaging more, communicating better. I've also learned from this, uh, this panel that we need to be able to communicate our positive news better. Uh, and also that uh, we are not trying to shy away from different difficult questions, the opposite, because we need to have those difficult questions so that we can change, because change is inevitable. Uh, we need to have this change to actually, actually be, uh, uh, like, uh, hold accountable for these three things, responsible, transparent, and accountable. So I'm committing here in this panel also to do much more engagement and communication. I think I might actually be positive about where we are in five to seven years. 
because I think about 15 years ago, we did a lot of work starting to educate school children, teenagers in terms of media and digital literacy. Um, and they're, though they're getting older, they're becoming parents, they're teaching their, their children, we're becoming better actually in empowering um, our citizens at a younger age. So I think, you know, I hope if we're standing five and seven years down the track, more and more of our population will actually have some of the life skills in the digital world that we were taught crossing the road and when we were when I was a child anyway. So I actually think we will be further progressed. I still I think there will still be some issues. We're still talking about some of the other issues we were talking about five, seven years ago, password security, security software. I think there still will be some of the issues we're facing today, but I think we'll be a bit more progressed down the road. Uh, I, I agree completely with Aura and with Haley, and I also see that the future in a very positive way because we have now taken conscience of the problems and we also are assessing the range of the problems and in the process to propose the remedy for that. And that is very important. And uh, I would see that there is a global regu regulation in place, which constantly uh, is all, all the time improved by platforms on self-regulation and legislators by their work. But to conclude, since I'm speaking as a last from U3, um, recently I had a meeting with um, uh, uh, school, uh, uh, school and um, I spoke about uh, platforms as information, social network. They of course are more professional than I in this field, but to allow them to understand the difference of our generations. I had an example and I want to share this example also with, with audience, to all, with all those who are uh, listening to us. Then I'm looking back in the history. I would say that the jump of technology is like my great grandmother first time encountering railway. The same it is for my generation, because during my lifetime, when I began with uh, pencil and then typing on typewriter, and now everything is instant and simultaneous and speed is enormous. Uh, that's why uh, knowing that railway was something very positive for human humanity as a development, I'm 100% convinced that also this digital world with 6G will be very positive development. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Kalni. The, the very, very good insp and inspiring ending to our today's discussion. And I really want to thank all of our speakers today because I really enjoyed our discussion and a lot of very, very good thoughts and ideas and inspiration. And of course, it's still a long way to go, but it's very good to hear that all of you are really committed to go and to find solution. And I want to thank all our uh, listeners and viewers and uh, also thanking for all your engagement and questions.